Welcome to the Agile Austin Coach Meetup. Um, I'm Sid Markle, and I'm joined with by Lonnie Dane. We're the co-hosts for this meetup. We meet monthly on Mondays, the first Monday of the month. And we like to focus on all the competencies for coaches and sometimes even going outside, thinking outside the box a little bit. For example, we've uh, had speakers come in about talk about clean language and ethics and a lot of different things. And ultimately we're here to help agile coaches to improve their craft. Um, we are part of a larger group, Agile Austin, that has lots of meetups. Um, we have meetups for Agile at Scale, the book, a book club, leaders, lean Kanban, a scrum master SIG, and then a monthly series. And if you're interested in any of these topics, you can learn more about them on meetup.com under Agile Austin. So Agile Austin is a, a nonprofit organization, and our, our mission is really to connect and foster professional growth through collaborative events such as this one. Um, and we couldn't do it without our sponsors. So the sponsors really help, uh, help us make this a reality, and we want to do, have a, a huge thank you to those people who and the companies that sponsor Agile Austin. And if you are interested in sponsorship, um, please reach out to us through contact at Agile Austin. We also have membership with Agile Austin. And it's uh, an annual fee of $35. And with that, you get access to the Slack community. You get to vote and sit on the board um, and also get special discounts for events and training. Speaking of the board, this is our 2022-23 newly elected board members. Um, it is, this lovely group of people helps us keep things running smoothly. And if you have any questions about the organization and the work that they're doing, you can reach out to them at board at agileaustin.org. Also, we have some volunteer opportunities. So if anybody's interested, we are looking for a director of uh, volunteers. So let us know if you're interested. That's an opportunity that's available. So coming up for this special interest group. Um, next month, we have uh, Jill Greenbaum joining us to talk about how to use visuals in coaching. In October, we have a lovely panel, as you heard earlier, about coaching the person, not the problem. And I think that's going to be a great discussion. And then in November, we're still thinking about, we're maybe thinking about doing something in person like cocktails and coaching or cocktails with coaches, or I don't know, we might do something like that, or we may bring in a speaker, but we're still working out the details on that. So stay tuned. But with that, I'd like to actually hand over the mic to Erin, who's gonna tell you a little bit about our speaker tonight. So it is my distinct happiness and joy to introduce Nadia Ichinomaya. And Nadia, we all practiced saying your name earlier, just so we came sort of close. But she's here to talk to us tonight from Sony Pictures. And one of my favorite things though about Nadia is her tenacity and her grit. She's one of those women who she'll be going this way and she's, you know, like, you know what, I feel like pivoting. So I'm gonna go pivot that way. And she doesn't just talk about it, she actually makes it happen. So right now I know that she's uh, writing a book. It's, um, it's got the words, um, Nadia, what's the name of the book again? It's called Plot Twist, yeah. Lessons <laughs> from a Hollywood Insider on scripting your work, directing your purpose and living a cinematic, life as a cinematic adventure. And so Nadia has actually done all of that. She doesn't just talk, but she literally does it. But she's here tonight to talk about the work that she has done at Sony Pictures uh, there. She's got cohorts, she's got initiatives. It's there's the uh, uh, Excellence in Agile program. Is that was it, Excellence in Agile? Agile Center of Excellence. Ah, I'm so close <laughs> on many things tonight and yet so far. Okay, but this is really about the servant leadership uh, journey there at Sony. So the reason this can be interesting to us as coaches is because this is one of those big enterprise level transformations, the big changes that are going on at that level. And Nadia has been there, done that, and lived it. But one of my other favorite things about Nadia is that she's one of those people who is generous with her network as well. She's introduced me to some really lovely people and she's always like, hey, you know what? I think you might really get along with this person. And you know what? You generally do, okay? But if you go look at Nadia's bio, you can also see some of the other fun and amazing things that she's done. Um, she worked with Bonnie Hunt. 
Uh, for those of you, there was a movie called Return to Me. And I think I quoted that to Nadia the first time that I met her. Nadia's like, oh, I'm in that. I'm like, yeah, so that was fun too. She also does a lot of work with women in tech in Hollywood there. And she's got lots of different board positions and the like. So I encourage you not only to listen to Nadia tonight, but also to reach out to her on LinkedIn and connect there, because she's really a big promote, proponent of connection and collaboration and really reaching out to people as well. So Nadia, with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to you. Wow. And that was probably the best intro I've ever gotten in my life. So thank you so much, Erin. And I just want to let you know that I hold you in such esteem and also great love. And I think you Thank get you. that. <laughs> um, all right, let me share my screen so we can get going here. There we go. Um, okay, so um, uh, just to you know, kind of, oops, stop here. Looks good on our end, Nadia. All right, that should be yeah. So uh, just a little bit about the company, just so you get the context. So. Here are some of our movies. You know, we had a big movie last year, Spider-Man and Ghostbusters Afterlife. And um, we have some really good TV shows. I, I love The Crown, um, especially. And um, we now have 9,000 employees, uh, you know, probably about 6,000 regular employees. And then um, we're, we seem to always be buying uh, companies. So with Funimation and Crunchyroll and PureFlix and some of our other um, companies that we've purchased. Uh, we've got that, about $9,000 and $10 billion in revenue. And uh, I wanted to start off with um, a kind of a, a testimonial. So I want to tell you a little bit about this guy named Darren Hopgood. And um, Darren works in our, as you can see, our global finance organization. And, um, you know, I'd say for most of the studios, the, the whole hierarchical command and control and not psychologically safe <laughs> um, way of doing things has been kind of the way of doing things for decades. I mean, if you've seen movies about the movie business, um, you know, the power uh, that comes with uh, people that are able to green light uh, movies, um, you know, it kind of gets to people's heads and, um, so it's kind of set up this this uh, top down way of doing things, and you know Darren had essentially kind of hit the hit the wall at work essentially. So he was given by his boss Bill a very big project, and um, we had trained Bill and some of uh, some of his leaders at that level, so EVP level, executive vice president level, uh, about servant leadership and. Um, and which was, you know, confronting in many ways. Um, I remember having a conversation where I said, you know, sometimes you might have to apologize to your employees. <laughs> and that was met with, what? <laughs> and, and I was like, and then someone, I remember someone piping up and say, yeah, I remember when you assigned a, a power, someone to work on a PowerPoint and they worked on it for three weeks and then you changed your mind? And the executive was just like, uh, wow. <laughs> so anyway, um, we started uh, bringing in servant leadership and it started really kind of changing the culture. So um, Bill had given this big and pro important project to Darren in London and Darren was going to take the project on himself, but instead Bill had a liberating conversation with him and said, you know what? Um, Cause Darren was like, how can I do this project in addition to everything else? And Bill said, well, you're gonna have to figure out some, a different way of doing things. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it's okay if things go wrong, which Darren had never heard before. That was like a complete different way of approaching things. So he had just entered the servant leadership circles program. It was good timing. And he said, wow, never heard that before. It's okay for it not to be perfect. All right. <laughs> so he ended up giving that project to a person on his team. And instead of overloading that person, he 
freed up that person's bandwidth by giving some of their projects to two other people on their team. And he had a, a liberating conversation with all three of those people and mm -hmm. said, guess what? It doesn't have to be perfect. So what happened was you go from a situation of, okay, I'm going to just pile on this other project versus I'm going to give more intellectually stimulating work to three people provide development opportunities for three people and give them a safety net that doesn't have to be perfect and they can take some risk. So this is what happened. This is an example of why Darren in London is such a big uh, fan of, um, of servant leadership and this program, which uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, you know, how kind of like viral it went to the company. But um, um, you know, when we first started teaching this program, we began, so the, the, pro, the program evolved. So we began by, you know, uh, Robert Greenleaf and the elements of a servant leader and all that. And um, problem was um, people looked at um, the elements of servant leadership. Like for example, one of them is listening. And one of them is being empathetic. And what people do, leaders, what they do is when they hear that is they go, I'm, I'm a good listener. Yep, I'm empathetic. And there's like no culture change, right? So, so what, what we did is, you know, we, we shared this video, which if you haven't watched it, um, you know, don't, don't watch it now. But, <laughs> but after this session, Google, um, do YouTube search under David Marquet, turn the ship around. There's a, a nine minute and 48 second video on how David Marquet went from taking this, um, you know, he was, he was supposed to take on one type of submarine. And the backstory is he gave an instruction on this new submarine that wasn't actually physically able to be implemented. But the, the submarine people, they were all men at the time, said, aye, aye, captain. And they said, you know, they started repeating the orders down the line. And he realized, my goodness, you know, if, if we keep on doing this and they keep on just saying, aye, aye, captain, and implementing my orders, we're going to end up dead or, um, or seriously, you know, off course. So he had to invent a new way of leading. And that's, you know, that's this turn the ship around model. He's, he's read that he's written this book, a workbook. And then he has this third book called leadership is language. It's, it's all great. We're actually having him come speak to Sony in September. Um, but, uh, you know, we sent this video to our CFO and he said, oh my gosh, so great. So he sent it to his direct reports. And they said, oh, wow, such an inspiring video. And there was no behavior change. So he thought, okay, well, I've got to repeat it. So he sent it out again. Oh, yes, we remember you sending this video out. Really inspiring. No behavior change. And see, what happens is when people take a training, they go back to their jobs and, you know, it's not like a bunch of elves did their work behind the scenes so they can implement something new. No, they have all this work still coming at them like a snowstorm. And so in order to survive, they just kind of keep doing what they've been doing. And the environment is not such that it pulls for that new way of working or leading, right? So the environment is, you know, I probably put this a little bit indelicly, but I say that they go back back to work and they're in the sewage, right? And, and if you've been living in sewage for long enough, it stops smelling. So um, we realized that we have to do something to actually get people to implement this over time. And with any kind of change effort, if you're trying to do too much change at, at once, um, our brains just really don't work that way. Um, I was listening to a talk that, um, someone was giving and they were saying that basically our neurons grow at about a millimeter a day, new neuro, neuro neuronic material or whatever the word is. So, um, so really, you know, like everyone starts new habits in January with so much enthusiasm, right? 
<laughs> and um, you know, the case for agile change is to do small change, incremental change, right? But but we we kind of don't approach these big transformational efforts in that way. We we approach them with trying to force you know a lot of change at the same time. So um, so you know we have this two hour class, but um, but the problem is that you know like I said, the class is theoretical um, and abstract and could be very inspiring and the scores from the class were really high you know four point something out of five but um it to to not give something to actually have that you know operationalize help people operationalize the change like like if you spent two hours working out in the gym and you expect to have muscles eh, it doesn't work that way right you have to practice you have to figure out a structure right so um, that's mm. why we went into, uh, I mean, this is the other thing I was looking at, which is this knowledge retention pyramid. So at the very top, you have this 5% lecture. So 5% retention when doing a lecture, 10% when you're reading, and then it goes, you know, 20 when there's audio visual, 30 when there's a demonstration. 50 is discussion group. So that's breakout session. Much better retention with breakout sessions and then 75 practice by doing and teach others so what i thought to myself is how can we get people to practice by doing and teach others like i mean that's like kind of a tall order right so um so you know these are some of the things i, I was kind of pondering um you know, in, in developing this program. So there's also this, something called the law of diffusion of innovation. So you, you can see that by the chart, you know, you kind of read it left to right. <laughs> and you start with the people that are really excited, you know, the innovators and the, uh, you know, early adopters. Um, so in that 2.5% 2, 2 and the 13.5%, these are the people that are, you know, super excited about something. They're they they love change. They welcome change. And um, okay, if you, hey. uh oh, if you've watched, um, there's a great YouTube video by Simon Sinek. Um, it's called How to, it's called How to Make a Cultural Transformation. That's another video to watch. It's about ten minutes. But essentially, it says. Don't try to get everyone to sign up for something. Um, employ psychology and get the ex extremely enthusiastic people to sign up first and make kind of make it a little bit exclusive in a way. Um, so you don't try to push people to, you know, like, you know, the whole aspect of compliance is. Is I never try to do things with like getting people to comply because it rarely is a good use of time. Um, so we really needed people to cross the chasm. So if, you, if you're familiar with this model, the two examples that I like to use is um, the Segway. So Segway uh, was welcomed by people as smart as Steve Jobs as like, this is the new way of, you know, people are going to design cities around this new way of doing things. Um, well, obviously that didn't happen, right? It That never crossed the chasm. Whereas the electric scooter um, did, right? So the question is, how do you get the the chasm to get crossed, right? And it's really a question of, you know, embrace the willing and, you know, nurture that base of people. And then the early adopters, the ones that are not, you know, they may be like, eh, let's wait and check it out. You know, I'm not going to be the first one jumping in, right? But those are people that get persuaded by, not me, <laughs> but by the by the innovators, um, and you know, this is kind of how this works. Um, someone asked me, you know, what do you do with the late majority? And um, 
you know, my question, my, my answer is always something like, well, you keep them informed because you never know, but you don't spend a lot of time trying to persuade them. Um, so that's, that's another thing that I kept in mind when I was developing this program. Um, so I also stumbled upon this article, which was in the BBC, and it was called the 3.5% rule, which kind of relates a little bit to the slide we just looked at, but it's basically saying that nonviolent pro protests are twice as likely to succeed as armed conflicts, and those engaging a threshold of 3.5% of the population have never failed to bring about change. I was like, what? Never? <laughs> and, you know, I think the whole thing between a nonviolent protest and a violent protest is, is, um, is, you know, if you have nonviolent protests, you're, you're, you're not, you're not stimulating the resistors, right? You're basically being very like embrace the willing, not making people wrong if they're not jumping in as soon, you know, just being very, embracing and hospitable and not on a high horse about anything like okay we have we have the only way the right way the best way so they, these kind of the three uh, aspects really stuck with me when when designing this program um so the other thing that we looked at was um so so we got essentially um, I think we led the class three times, this two hour class three times. And then we asked people, do you want to sign up for a program? And after, you know, after the class program. And HR told me that, um, that the signups for these types of things is usually around 10%, but we were at 30% or more. So I think one of the reasons why this was successful, this is a successful program, is that, um, well, I'll get to that in a moment, but um, but you know, here are some people that that uh, signed up, and you know the the um, people here. So there's Rob Pratt. I hope you can see this. Get this out the way. Rob Pratt and Jason Speltro, they um, had worked together for years, but their their um, business relationship was very formal. Um, but we put people in. We call them circles, even, you know, so this was a circle of five people. So out of the, the first cohort of 32 people that signed up, we split people up in, co in circles of four or five people. So we wanted to keep the number high enough that if people, you know, missed a session, it wouldn't be like just two people, but we didn't want it to be like six or seven because that gets difficult to schedule, right? So we wanted to keep the number around four or five. Um, and we keep the number also, um, there's a few things that we kind of keep in mind when we're scheduling these things. One is we don't like people to be linked up with people that they already know and work with because there's kind of a freedom and a psychological safety in working with strangers. Sometimes you can confide in people a lot more easy, easier when you don't know them, right? I mean, probably, has anyone ever had that situation where you confide someone like on a train, something that you would never say to like your sister or a brother or a best friend because you're never gonna see them again, right? Or you don't have to like see them the next day. So we set up these um, circles very much where you would, be people of all different levels and people from different silos. So one of the kind of goals was to melt these silos, which in this example happened. So information security and global finance operations, they sometimes work um, not so well together, <laughs> um, but they these two found that they're being in a circle together actually really enhanced their working relationship. So that happened many, many times. Um, so uh, one of the guiding principles of this program was to make it inclusive and not exclusive. So, um, you know, that's 
it's easy to say, oh yeah, inclusive, you know, but it's, it's you, you got to really walk the talk on this. So for example, when we set up this program, there was a senior executive that said, oh, well, I don't know if people that are senior vice presidents are going to want to be in the same program with people that are analysts. And I was like, oh my God. Like, really? Um, and, you know, so that was one of the things I really insisted on was, look, you know, are you that arrogant that you don't think you can learn from someone that just joined the company a week ago? Well, maybe I think you can. <laughs> and so um, that was confronting for people because, you know, there's certain people that wanted to be only with, you know, people of the same level and I was like that ain't gonna happen the other big thing was um to include individual contributors because a lot of times in a lot of programs it's like oh this is this is just for vps and above this is just for this kind of people and i just was like nope uh, because first of all individual contributors how are you going to learn to be a leader if you're not like learning to be a leader, right? So that's one thing. And the other thing was just because someone's an individual contributor today doesn't mean they weren't one recently. And um, influence is a lot more tricky to tame than, you know, just your title, right? I mean, we've probably met lots of people that had these impressive titles that you wouldn't be influenced with at all. And again, also people that didn't have the impressive title that you're like, wow, that person's really got some interesting things going on, right? So um, this was something that, like I said, it was, it was disruptive in the company to set this up like this, um, but we made it, um, you know, again, there were people that found out about the program. I don't think I've mentioned this, but um, there were people at PlayStation that found out about the program and they're like, well, can we join? I'm like, yeah, more the merrier. And uh, so we've had probably 150 people from PlayStation um, who have also joined the program and, and they've evangelized it inside that company as well as um, some of the sister companies that I mentioned heard about it. Um, so that's been really great. We really, you know, it, like I said, it has been disruptive because there's a snobism uh, of, oh, well, you know, they're an individual contributor. How are they going to, well, <laughs> first of all, they're going to understand more about what their leader is doing. Um, and, and this is about culture change and this is about gaining skills and, you may not be a leader at work, but you may lead something in your community group or your, your faith-based organization or you know, your family, right? If you, you have children, you definitely have a good chance to practice servant leadership with your children. So that was one of the guiding principles, number one. Um, so we've already, already talked about this. Um, let me just skip that. So the... the um, Guiding principle two was to intentionally invite diverse perspectives, experiences, and levels. So we actually have been doing this program for two years now, So, which means that we started it in the pandemic. So typically our training was very headquarters focused. And the only way something, like we really didn't have any global programs. But with this, it was like, hey, you know, video just democratizes learning. And, you know, you know as long as, uh-huh. Before we get into principle two, I think Spring yeah. has a question. Okay, go I for it, Spring. Do. I do, I was just curious. Um, in the scenario with, um, you know, mixing at all levels of the organization, did you have any, and I know you were also mentioning you kind of have that psychological safety with someone you don't know, mm -hmm. but since these executives were so high up per se, potentially, did mm -hmm. you feel that the employees were 
kind of okay with that? Were they psychologically safe? Were they open? Were they, or did they feel like they had to be, oh my gosh, like the VP of this is in the room with me? So that's a great question. And yes, at first. So what would happen is, um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we actually had coaches. So um, um, part of the thing was after we did cohort one, we did surveys, of course. And one of the ideas that came from cohort one was we love the program so much. And by the way, we, we did these, we, did, we didn't finish cohort one. Uh, we started cohort two while cohort one was still running, like, like literally like a month or two later. So there was, there's always like three cohorts going on at the same time. Um, but we were able to apply the learnings from cohort one, like the first few missions to the mission of cohort two, because we were kind of doing all this at the same time. So one of the, one of the things that came out of it was we want to, we want to coach the next cohort. Great idea. So each circle of four to five people has their own coach and most of them are not agile coaches uh they're people that love the program that have been in the program they none of them had finished the program yet but they were just intrepid and they wanted to have the culture change happen so one of the things um that the coaches do when they're setting up the kind of like the cultural aspect is they would usually set up a, a chat on Microsoft Teams that, you know, that group could chat about and debrief and communicate and all that stuff. But one of the things they would also do is set up the first meeting. And one of the things that we try to impress on people, people is that each circle has to have a leader and it should not necessarily be the person with the highest title and that people should leave their titles at the door. Um, so that was the coaching that the circle coaches gave to their circles um, to really kind of encourage that, hey, we're all here to learn. And um, like I said, at first people really to get people to that first meeting was when people start sharing with each other and become vulnerable with each other. It's like this magic happens. And um, that's when we, if we can get people to that first meeting, the chances of them dropping out are so much less than if they don't, if they just do things through chat and through, you know, these more artificial methods. Um, but yeah, to get people to that first meeting. Um, and we have people that have completed the circles and still meet once a month because of that bond that was created uh, of psychological safety and, and confronting the things that they had to confront about themselves and their own leadership and their ego and their pettiness and their, their um, failing and trying things out and experimenting and and you know confessing things to each other that they probably wouldn't do with their team you know and so um that it's a it's a great question but that's kind of how we kind of wore down the 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 focus on titles awesome thank you cool uh anyone else please step in with questions at any time. I'd rather have you do it now when it's on your mind than to wait till later. Um, okay, so uh, that was also very intentional and um, something that was unusual for our company. <laughs> so let me talk about the missions. So um, when I was designing this program, I did it the agile way, meaning I did not say, hmm, we're going to have 12 missions and it's going to be, you know, like I was literally just building it while flying the plane. Like I did not have the next mission written out or conceived while I was writing the first mission. 
So it was, um, you know, it was, there was tons of experimentation and tons of let, let's try this, but you know, and not everything worked, you know? I mean, we first, I was a bit too aggressive at first and I wanted to have every mission have be two weeks. And that was too, too much for people. So missions are sent out every three weeks. So we built a website on SharePoint where, and we haven't, we've now had it automated. This was not automated at first, but essentially people get put in these circles of four or five people and they get their first mission. And we say to people, this is obviously on top of your regular job. And we estimate that it's going to be about two hours per month of work now you can apportion the two hours in whatever way you want we approach this program very much as servant leaders so we said 10 minutes a day to invest in yourself hopefully isn't too much but you can scale up or scale down your engagement depending on vacations projects paternity leaves paternity leaves all that stuff so um there's nothing to turn in there's no homework that has to be turned in. So it's all about trusting people that if they have the passion and the interest um, that they, they would be you know, completing the homework. Um, but there's also the peer pressure factor. So once you set up this accountability, <laughs> um, you kind of don't want to let your team down and say, you know, say, say everyone's meeting once a week. Some people were meeting once every two weeks, some every three weeks, but mostly it was mostly once a week or once every two weeks. Um, they would be like, hmm, I know everyone else is going to have watched those videos. I want to be on the same page with them. So the peer pressure aspect and the accountability partner aspect was something that we learned and used to our advantage in order to keep people sticking to the program. And the, the uh, dropout rate has been very low, less than 10%. Um, so people have found ways to, you know, sometimes people don't watch the videos until they're meeting and they watch them all together and discuss them. So we didn't micromanage how people were going to process their missions. We said, this is your mission. We have a recommended one that we would like one assignment that we'd like you to do. And then here's five to seven optional ones. We really try to design the missions for different people's learning style. Some people like to watch videos. Some people like to journal. Um, some people like to um, you know, fill out worksheets. So um, some people just like to read articles. So we'd have every mission would have a different um, blend of how people like to learn. And we try to make it as edible as possible um, so that people weren't overwhelmed. So 12 missions, every one mission every three weeks adds up to a 10 month program. Now, that's a long time for someone to stay in a program. You know, I mean, even three months, people can barely stay with a program. But because of these factors of give people something, but not something that's too overwhelming, because then people are just like, oh, screw it, I can't do any of it. I'm just, at, I'm out of here. Um, and the, the camaraderie factor, the, the, um, the accountability factor was, was really good. There was also another thing that we added to it. So we understand that people are motivated by different things. Some people are motivated by status, right? So uh, around mission three to four, they can do a readout. And so essentially the readout is using the retrospective format. Um, failure, excuse me, successes to celebrate, failures to celebrate, and kind of what insights to action. So people would fill out a retro, retro board and they would present their retro board in a readout. You know, each readout, each group would go. 
and spend you know five minutes or so introducing themselves. So they got really creative with um, the names of their teams. You know, were a lot of you know Breaking Bad and you know other kind of fun things to do with Sony products. Um, some of them included videos that they recorded, and you know they they got pretty sophisticated. Some people got really sophisticated, but essentially they would introduce themselves. I remember one team, they all did, they all kind of like dressed up as men in black, you know, with like white shirts and glasses and, and, um, and, uh, you know, the black, black jackets um, and uh, video game themes. Um, but this is the key is that our executive sponsor attended every single readout. And we have now 10 cohorts we're going to start the 11th one in august this month um and each cohort has two readouts and some of them have three because we would do one in the morning for for uh europe middle east africa and latam and us and then we do one at seven o'clock at night for asia pack same with our training we did we did some training from seven to nine in the morning and then some training from nine to eleven and then twelve to two and then seven to nine so that we really span the world. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it also got really um, diverse and uh, inclusive. So um, essentially that's, that's kind of how we design the missions. Um, and with those readouts gave people something to anchor to and to work on as a group. Um, and then to do the last, the second readout, which was at the end of the program would be what are your top three favorite assignments? So people would kind of be forced to think about, oh, what were my first, my top three assignments and how did that impact my team or wh what have you? So um, yeah, I, I think that was a little bit about the, um, the missions, but I'm happy to answer more questions about that. Um, so that, that was these circles of transformation was really where the rubber hit the road in this program. I would not not do a transformation of this kind without some kind of circles and cohort program because I think that is the winning strategy to get culture change to happen is um, is by helping people operationalize it and not just sending them out after two hour class and saying, you know, have fun storming the castle. <laughs> Good luck. Um, it's Not just, a, sorry, uh -huh. there's a question um, in the chat in terms of defining a readout. I don't know, Sherry, what sure. specific additional information you wanted around that. Yeah. Uh, do you have a question or do you want me to talk about what the um, readout more? For Sherry. So Sherry, if you have more information, uh, if you want to come off mute and share, if not, um, Nadia, I think just thinking about maybe who usually, who is it for, who's attending it, any, what are they, sure. you mentioned some of what they were sharing. So the readouts were um, an hour. And um, so say if we were going to, we just did a readout for cohort 10, uh, they did their first readout. So um we asked them to prepare a presentation where they would um, essentially prepare four slides. So the first slide would be an introduction of their circle. Like I said, usually with some kind of fun theme, you know, angry birds or whatever. Um, and then they would have the three slides of, um, you know, success, wins to celebrate, failures to celebrate and insights to action, meaning what insights did they have as a team or as individuals um, that could be like, you know, this is not working in the program or I like this or this had this impact. And to the, the presentation happened to uh, of each circle to the other people in that cohort. So we have cohorts of 30 people, we had our biggest cohort had 80 people in it. Um, so that was, you know, that was two readouts. Um, but essentially it, it, 
we would have our CFO attend them and, you know, I'd, I'd kick it off and say, you know, these five circles are going to do their readout. And then at the end, our CFO would say some closing remarks about what he saw and heard. So he would usually, he, one of the things we're trying to do is change the culture of failure and make it um, okay to fail and okay to talk about and actually a good thing to talk about. So uh, he usually would bring up something like that, like, oh, you know, someone mentioned that they tried to do this and it failed and, you know, and it was, it's great to be able to try things. And, you know, so he would say something to kind of underline um, what he'd heard and what had made an impression on him. Um, and Nadia, people- mm -hmm. it sound, I love the way that you're all a, are able to elevate that discussion. It may, mainly sounds like the retrospective was a presentation by the participants to talk about their experience in the program, give them visibility with their leadership, and then also play back to each other so they could learn from each other. Yes, yeah. exactly. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so just to give you, um, this was another idea that came out of uh, one of our surveys is that someone said, hey, it'd be nice if we finished the program and got a, a PDF of our participation. And so this is some, this is an example, uh, but people, we, we have them customized with people's names. And so some people have posted these on LinkedIn. I mean, it's not an official sort of certification or anything, but um, it is kind of a celebration of the 10 months of effort that they put into it. And, um, you know, it uh, celebrated their completion of a 10 month program. <laughs> so that was one of the ideas that came out of um, one of the cohorts. Here's a few, um, kind of stats. So it's the 10 month circles program with 12 missions, one every three weeks. And we're re we usually recommend a two hour time commitment. Um, these are the two books that we focus on. So the turn the ship around book, we spend the first four missions on that. So there's three C's, there's um, control, clarity and competence So we spend a mission on each of those three and then one tying it all together. And then we have a fifth mission that's kind of transitioning into the multipliers book, which is to me, one of the most um, actionable books on leadership that I've ever re read, um, highly recommend. And so in the multipliers model, you've got five disciplines of um, a multiplier. And so we spend a mission on uh, the liberator, the investor, the uh, debate maker, the talent magnet. And I can't remember the first one. That'll come to me. Um, um, anyway, so we spend uh, a lot of time on those missions and we focus on the art of the question and how to build habits. Um, and each mission focuses on these books, but includes other things like the Harvard Business Review article on um, who's got the monkey or, you know, a Br Brene Brown um, thing on values or um, uh, a Simon Sinek or Daniel Pink are, uh, video. So the, the missions had a lot of variety and something for everything, everyone, but we're kind of focused on, these were like the bedrock material. And then we'd bring in like, you know, radical candor or this, or, you know, some other materials um, that that were leadership oriented. Um, and go ahead. one quick question about that. So in the missions, did they, did each circle create their mission based on the activity or the reading or the, or so it's predefined missions? Yeah, it's the predefined missions, but they, it's okay. kind of the choosy own, your own adventure in that, you have each mission would have five to seven assignments and some people would do all of them and some people would just do one of them right so it could be all about your time and bandwidth and interest so some people probably just watch the videos but there was always there was always some reading some journaling some video watching some articles and 
you know, sometimes um, some workbook stuff. So as I mentioned, the circle coaches, you're welcome. Any other questions, just, just fire them up off. Um, so these are the circle coaches and, you know, these are the heroes. Um, some of these people have been coaching um, since, you know, for two years. And this is in addition to their jobs and all but two people on here are actual agile coaches. I mean, I am obviously, but then Stuart and Jason are agile coaches and everyone else are either individual contributors or, or, or uh, managers, um, but they love the program and they found that doing it with their participants cemented their understanding of the material and they got a whole new take of it and they they practice being servant leaders so um this is again a voluntary thing they've opted in and um yeah we've we constantly get people that are like how i would not i want to be a servant leader excuse me i want to be a circle uh, coach so this program was worked really well there, there are a couple of questions coming up in the chat okay um, there's one about you were on the slide, the circle of transformation. You were starting to say something about you wouldn't do a transformation like this without the cohorts. Was there something else there that you were going to touch on as well for for this topic? Um, let me see. Um, I think I I think I talked about what I wanted to for that. Um, if I'm not mistaken. All right, they're just trying to make sure we didn't miss any great knowledge from you. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, some other questions around, let's start with this one. How did you decide the content for the missions and what they would be? <laughs> oh my gosh, like I said, it was very much like building the plane while I was flying it. I, I just thought, you know, I just started with mission one. I was like, okay, there's a workbook from turn the ship around. Let me look through that, right? <laughs> um, let me look online to see what David Marquet has. Oh my gosh, he's got like 400 videos on, um, he calls them leadership nudges. So I'm not gonna send everyone the 400, but which are the ones that would be associated with clarity? Um, so we, we built a SharePoint site um, that essentially has all the content so people don't have to go to YouTube and look for it. It's like all there in different missions. And it was, it was very much driven by how can I have content that's well-rounded for different people's learning styles? So I would just be like, okay, well, here's what people might be dealing with now. Um, I'm going to write something that has you know, some journaling questions on um, building new habits or confronting, um, you know, your anti-patterns on leadership. And so it was, so I would, I would spend usually, you know, a good part of a day on a weekend um, writing it. Like it would be like a lot of, uh, YouTube searches and oh this TED talk looks interesting and so I would just come up with stuff and you know a lot of times it was a lot you know I was like oh my gosh this mission has so much too much in it because I was you know enthusiastic person so I would just be like you don't have to do all of it just do what brings you joy <laughs> what sparks joy do it um if you have a mission that, you know, doesn't spark joy, just don't do it. Um, so that's how I would come up with it. Like right now I'm creating a new program on Liz Wiseman's second book called Impact Players. And um, so we, we, this is kind of nothing to do with sermon leadership, but um, we had a lunch and learn last week with our CFO and we had 330 people attend it because so many people are into this new book called Impact Players by Liz Wiseman that was re uh, released on in November. And so I'm like, oh, I've got to create, uh, I've got to create submissions. <laughs> so 
let me find some stuff that's going to help people um, in where they might be. So it, it's, it's kind of a, like, I have to essentially just feel a lot of empathy for the people that are in the program and go, okay, what, what do I think they need now? What do I think could be useful? And try to spread it around a good mix of videos, articles, journaling, et cetera. So there's something for everyone. Awesome. So the core, the books became like that genesis. And then from there, you kind of built on to, to the additional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, there's some questions and I believe you answered one of these in terms of recruiting the coaches. You said the coaches actually, actually came from the previous cohorts and volunteered. Um, and then there was kind of a follow-up question to that was, you mentioned a survey and get, giving feedback. Was that also given to these coaches and then they kind of brought it forward? Yeah, we, we did a lot of, we, we do a lot of surveys. So there's a survey in the two hour class in the last 10 minutes, we give a survey because we find that if you don't give it to them after they won't fill it out. So <laughs> we give them time in the class to fill it out and that's where they can sign up for the circles program. That's the only way they sign up. So they have to fill out the survey, um, which, you know, has five questions or something on it. Um, and we surveyed cohort one, we surveyed people to find out, like we would survey them after each mission uh, to find out, you know, which, what resonated with people. Um, we were looking for, are there certain themes? And we found out that it, it, people do like a mix, you know, um, some people, you know, they, like I said, they only want to watch the videos um, and there's enough there. Right. So um, some people, you know, wanted it pushed to them, like they wanted an email and some people wanted just to go to a website. So we, 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 we've done a lot of surveys um, to, to, yeah, get feedback. Those are all the questions right now in chat. Okay. So, uh, Metrics. So like I mentioned, a thousand people have completed the two hour course, which is a lot if you think about the how many people are in the company. Um, and we now have over four, uh, 500. This is, this is a little outdated slide, but we have now over 500 people that have, are in the circles program or have completed it. Um, and now we're going to start our 11th cohort in this month. So, but usually we have three to four concurrent ones. So that's always a um, fun challenge. <laughs> um, this is one of our circle coaches. And this is, you know, she's in LATAM. Um, this, is, this is a testimonial. We use testimonials also in order to sell the course because we can't be everywhere. So we, when we sell, when we send out the syllabus, it has the benefits of the servant leadership, the learning objectives, and then as we were rolling along, we got more and more testimonials from people. We solicited them and said, you know, they would say something, oh, great course. Great. Would you like to, be, you know, can you write a testimonial? And a lot of people did, which, which was great because, um, you know, people are influenced by testimonials. I mean, that's, that's, that's how Amazon reviews work, right? So, um, uh, you know, if you are someone that's working in LATAM, you're going to be more influenced by this woman than me, who you've never met, right? So um, we use these testimonies. We also did video testimonials too, which were kind of time consuming. We didn't do as many, we didn't uh, record as many of them, but we, as we wanted to, but those were also super fun to have people record testimonials. Um, and that's it. So, uh, questions. There's one thing I was um, curious about. And, um, so were, so how did you, okay. My question has to do with how did you get the, the executive sponsorship? And it sounds like it was for everybody in the company. Was it run out of HR or like, what, like, how did you get the mission to, to take this to the people, so to speak? So, um, 
so it it was one of those things that um I I was able to to develop a trusted partnership between me and the CFO. Okay. And the CFO of our company is unlike most CFOs. Most CFOs, they concentrate on the numbers and they let their CEO and their human resources do stuff like that, right? Our CFO is extremely progressive. He had a telecommuting program before the pandemic. He loves to read and he's always reading interesting books and he's very open to suggestions from employees. So, um, and he's all about, I think he's been with the company now five years, but he's all about, you know, change the culture. And, you know, there's an aspect of servant leadership that is very, you know, kind of like, empowering and all that stuff but there's an as actually a financial aspect about it that's very compelling because if you have this command and control culture of just you know the only people are the smart people are the leaders and everyone is dumb if you have that kind of theory x point of view you're not getting the best out of people but if you have that theory why aspect and you just go, everyone has brilliance to them. Everyone has a certain kind of genius. Let's encourage it and leverage it. You know, from a, from a cold hard cash aspect, you're going to get much more out of your people. So, you know, he has this very empowering aspect to it, but it, it, it pays off financially as well. Now, because, you know, people are empowered and they, they, they know that if they come up with an idea that it might get listened to, right. Then, then squash down. So, um, so that was something that is, you know, depending on your situation in your company, you can approach it from, if you have a really empowering kind of culture about like people and all that stuff, then, then I would approach it that way. But if you don't, you can also approach it that, hey, you know, this is about getting the most out of our people, uh, which sounds kind of exploitative. But but when you think about it and you think about like how people have this, most people have this deep yearning to feel like they matter and they have an impact and they they're not just some, you know, robot um, that you can really you know, leverage people and they're, yes, you have to take a chance and, you know, you have to take, you know, be able to give control, which is a risk from many people. Well, it's uh, symbiotic, but, right? You, you get and you yeah. get, right? Yeah. So, um, so the thing with HR is a little interesting because this program did not go through HR and it was, and you know the OKR program also was a brainchild of our CFO, who, who has incubated programs in the area that he can control, which is his groups. Mm -hmm. And you know the OKR program is now spreading to the rest of the company. The servant leadership program is now being adopted by human resources, right? So I am in August 16th, I'm leading a class that's in the human resources catalog. So, you know, it, it, I, I kind of feel like you, you embrace the will and you go to where you're going to go through an open door and try to build some successes there and, and hope it spreads out from there versus spreading yourself then and trying, you know, and then having your, you know, your your pearls fall on you know deaf ears or whatever the expression right. is <laughs> so that would be you're going to find some advocate somewhere hopefully and you start with there and you cultivate there until you you achieve a momentum and then it it hopefully spreads out from there awesome. thank you so much uh there's another question in chat it said you're trying to change company culture is ultimately kind of your your core thing that you talked about. Um, how is the culture changing and how do you know? 
And I had this question as well in terms of like, what are you tracking to get some of those ultimately answer that question? Yes, it is driving the business results like you're talking about. Like, I know some of those may be longer metrics, but what might be those things that you're tracking to know this is actually improving the culture and therefore, you know, the business? So it is a hard thing to track because it's hard to measure is this making a difference right but one of the one of the things that we're looking at and it has to it it is done by invita invitation is um we do these psychological safety checks um and that that's when we go into um a, a, a group and you know it has to be at the invitation of the manager and we ask them you know to rate their manager on a scale of one to five on um, you know, how safe they feel. Five is everything is discussable without filtering. And then level one is nothing is discussable without filtering. Level three and above is, is acceptable. And this is something that John Hill uh, brought, brought into the company. Um, and then the, that's, that gets the metrics on one-on-one -on -one with your boss, with the team only, the team with the boss, and then with other teams, you get these four scores. We do them using pointing poker to, so we get an aggregate score. And then um, we also ask them, what makes you feel more safe? What makes you feel less safe? And then things we can do to improve team safety. And we use Easy Retro for that because it's also anonymous. So we wanna make sure that these surveys for this is anonymous for the psychological safety checks so that people feel safe. And we don't include HR or that person's, we include the manager obviously, but not that manager's manager. So we wanna make it safe for the manager to do these psychological safety checks. So um, a lot of times people will have a so-so score and then we'll work with coaching that manager and have everyone go through the servant leadership program. You know, we invite them. And a lot of times their scores will go up. Um, you know, I, I was talking with one of the leaders here in procurement and I said, wow, you know, why did your score go up um, in three months by like over a third, like, you know, it's like 38%. And he said, well, I was doing everything in the servant leadership program with the multiplier stuff. And I was making sure that I was being a multiplier and not a diminisher. So you know, that's one way. Uh, the other thing is just kind of like how people talk to each other. Um, you know, people will reference the servant leadership program as a method for, well, the way we're doing things here is through the servant leadership model. And so people are like, what? What's that? You know, um, so it's, it's, you could kind of tell by how things are languaged. Like when people are using the I intend to language, you know, okay, yeah, you know, they, they're they employing, you know, that's, you know, or they're saying, oh, you know, Craig, you're being a bit of a rescuer, right? So when you hear the different jargon, so to speak, being used, you can say, okay, oh, okay, there's something different that's happening in this team. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's spreading like organically and no one has to do this program is saying that people are getting stuff out of it that that makes it worth their time investment. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a little tough to measure, but at least from a quantitative measure, but uh, we try to take a stab at it. What other questions? We have anything? We don't have anything in the chat right I'm now. I'm so curious. Is there are there any other large organizations that you know of that are doing something similar? So I talked to a company called BD, and they are using Ken Blanchard. Um, they they've got some kind of contracts with Kenneth Blanchard's company. Um, this is a large healthcare company. I think they have something like 80,000 employees. There's a woman over there in the England office who's responsible for L and OD, uh, leadership and organizational development. And um, 
she says that they've been using servant leadership um, and we've kind of, you know, cross paths and exchanged information. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what's kind of coming off the top of my head. I'm sure there's probably others. I think my favorite thing that I've heard you say so far tonight, Nadia, was about, you know, you had participants were immediately turning around and starting to coach and just that confidence and that built in them and that continuation forward and people saying, oh, we're seeing that there, but then also kind of those multiplier aspects. Well, I'm doing just what you said over there. And it's like, we're seeing my scores go up. It's like, oh yeah, really beautiful. Yeah. And, and just to answer Sherry's, it's BD. Um, I'm not sure what that stands for, but uh, some kind of healthcare company devices or something. BD. Yeah. I will mention. Um, I'm at IBM and we, we don't have a servant leadership program, but there's stuff that reminds me of some similarities. We don't call it servant leadership. We have some different things, um, but I think we can learn a lot from your experience. And I really thank you for sharing it with us how that's gone for you and the changes that you're seeing. I'm wondering, does anybody else have any questions that you'd like to You've got Nadia here and you've heard her story. Are there any things that you're curious about? I have a question. It sounds so in the beginning, what I think it's really neat to hear from you that you didn't have like a hundred percent plan, um, that some of it had to build while you're going. Um, when I'm thinking about, I'm more in project management, but I think there's always this ideal that you're supposed to have the whole thing planned out before you launch, um, but you miss opportunities of just being able to learn, to learn, feel fast and it's okay. You, you adjust. I'm curious as to how you kept up your energy. I know some of the, in the building phase, um, there can be a lot of energy expenditure. Uh, what kind of helped you? Great question. Um, so it's a great question. And I think you have to really love this and you have to kind of have a love of people and um I'm I've been passionate about leadership since I was in my 20s and I'm in my 50s now so I've always been curious about how people are influenced by things you know like why do people do the things they do and um you know the idea of getting people excited for a North Star, uh, whatever that might be, whether it's a product or a service, um, and having that feeling of, you know, kind of camaraderie and collaboration, um, and we're all in this together. I mean, I know it sounds a little corny, but, um, but I get excited about that. So in terms of, I, I feel like this is, a job worth doing you know it's like it's worth my life not to get you know super corny about it but it's I feel that that um you know if 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 leaders are better to their employees I'm getting a little emotional but if leaders are better to their employees because you you know you need you, you hear these things about people and how badly they're treated by people by by their leaders and it just makes my heart break you know and so when I think if I can be a little bit of a light um, to show how leaders can be better to the employees and 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 um, I want to be part of that you know I, I and and to be that little light to say you know, this is a better way of doing things and you still can make your deliverables and have your projects and, you know, just, this is a, you know, come in, the water's warm, <laughs> you know, then that's what 
fires me up. Yeah. So that's, that's what's my purpose. And that's what my passion and my reason for being. So sorry to uh, get all weepy. Don't but, apologize. Uh, that's no, like the best part of the whole presentation. You your, your vulnerability <laughs> in sharing with us is like amazing. Thank you for doing that. Well, I, I, uh, I didn't expect to be the waterworks here, but, um, but yeah, it, it really, it, that's why, you know, I feel that that is the way for me to be used. Mm -hmm. I want to be used that way. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that <laughs> because I feel like so many companies promote really talented technical people, but mm -hmm. they're not usually training for how to be a leader. So this seems like this is a wonderful program to help leaders to be effective leaders. So thank you. Well, that's why I, I want to talk about this program to other people and not be all selfish, like, oh, you know, keep it to Sony, you know, because you know, it's it, to me, it's like there's so many bad patterns out there. And, you know, if if you all could, you know, as agile coaches can take some of this to the people that you're working with and, you know, find a way of, of being able to convince them to to adopt these different styles and programs and stuff, then, like I said, you know, it's it's really magical to see how people have blossomed. I mean, I, I you know, it'll make you cry. I mean, I, I, there was this one woman who started the same week I did. Her name is Hope. And she said, you know, I've been with company in IT for 15, 16 years. And now I feel like I matter. I'm like, oh my God, like how can I start crying in the meeting? Um, so beautiful. You know, so. Anyway. Nadia, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful vision and program that you've managed, that you've put out into the world. It's beautiful. I think that we're all touched and, and inspired by your story and your, and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. So I just want to say a few words as we wrap up here. Um, uh, next month, we have Jill Greenbaum, who's joining us to talk about using visuals and coaching conversations. Jill is fantastic. She's been with us a few other times and um, I always find her sessions really engaging and, and fun. You'll probably wanna have a pen and pencil and um, actually, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a good time with that. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for coming. This is a, we I, I really as a community, we couldn't do it without you. And the conversations we have here, the level of conversation we have is always inspiring. And I thank you all for attending and coming back time and again. And again, thank you so much, Nadia, for such a beautiful sharing your, your journey with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks especially to Aaron to, uh, mm, to yes. introduce me to Sid and Lonnie and uh, all of y'all. <laughs> thank you. And reach out to me anytime if you want. I'm happy to help. Thank you. We will share the recording after this. So Keep an eye out for that. And thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Well done, Have a good day. Thanks. Have you a good too. One. Bye bye. Bye.